So why should we be concerned with widening participation? Three reasons are generally given. The reasons generally given for why higher education institutions should invest in higher participate in widening participation are that first of all, it contributes to social justice. As I already mentioned, in a democratic society, everyone should be um, everyone should be able to have equal access to uh, educational institutions that enable them to achieve their ambitions. Furthermore, this should apply regardless of their socio-economic backgrounds. Second, it contributes to inclusiveness and social mobility. Around the world, education is valued. Not only is it perceived as a way to achieve economic gains, it is also a way to become more socially engaged and acquire the tools and skills that contribute to human flourishing. Third, there are economic benefits from increasing the number of people in education. As I just mentioned, graduates have uh, access to more jobs with higher pay and better working conditions, but society is also said to benefit from the increase in education, uh, people getting an, educa an education, as education contributes to the development of new businesses and a skilled workforce. Now, these benefits have been subject to critique for various reasons, and I'll mention a few. For instance, one problem raised is that the focus on mining participation can create structures that hide the non-equitable structures by that hide these structures by which are non-equitable by disguising them under the idea that the university is fair and inclusive. It can also be questioned whether there is an over emphasis on higher education as a path to societal and personal flourishing. Are we really to believe that the only path 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 to happiness, for instance, is through educating yourself. And then there are those mainly representatives of elite higher education institutions who are worried that the increase of diverse students will lead to diminishing quality in education at said institutions. And I want to address that, address that last worry and say two things. First, there is weak evidential support that correlates uh, of that correlates a weakening quality of education with the inclusion of diverse students. Rather, diversity is often perceived as something that contributes to the quality of the education. It is highlighted that a more diverse student group better prepares students for the challenges faced when entering the workforce and an increase uh, uh, and an increasingly diverse world. And then second, the emphasis on widening participation and inclusion does not mean that we are making the act of teaching and learning easier. Students are not allowed to participate in any way as long as they belong to a marginalized group or require special support. This certainly looks different depending on where you work as an educator. However, here in Sweden, there is a requirement for students to achieve all the knowledge, skills, and abilities set out in the curriculum. All these goals have to be met. For this reason, the teacher's ambition to broaden, widen participation and make teaching more inclusive should not lead to any neglect of teaching these goals. Everyone should achieve the course objectives and the truth is that not all people can become uh, what they want as they are not able to um, achieve these course objectives. Sometimes there may be practical barriers to working in a particular profession, for instance. But let me take an example to give you some insights into how the Swedish higher education system works and hopefully gives you some uh, food for thought. Uh, during a course that I had last fall, I invited a lawyer to talk about the legal aspects of syllabi in Sweden. Uh, syllabis, uh, syllabuses are legal documents in Sweden which place demands on teachers in relation to how to use them and what they are expected to teach during courses. And during this session, uh, a session, the co one course participant mentioned that he had taken, he had been giving a course on learning mental arithmetic, like counting in your head, which teachers in his subject or area felt was necessary when students entered the work workforce within their uh, field then that they were teaching in. 
The course was compulsory for all, uh, mandatory for all students in the subject area. He further explained that they had a student who had a certificate stating that he or she could not do uh, that. He further stated that they had a situation where one student had uh, uh, a certificate stating that he or she could not do mental arithmetic and that he or she therefore had the right to use a calculator in all courses. With this, the purpose of the course was lost and the teaching team therefore had to consider whether it was at all possible for the student to complete the course. And since the course was uh, mandatory, it became a question on whether the student could complete his or her education at all if he or she did not complete, complete this particular course. Well, uh, usually these kinds of things uh, are quite easy. You, you can solve them in any way, but it becomes an interesting question anyways. When the teacher during uh, that teacher during the our course asked the invited lawyer about this issue, he, the lawyer was quite clear. According to the curriculum, one of the objectives was to, a, to be able to do mental arithmetic. If the student could not do it without a calculator, it meant that he or she could not pass the course and therefore could not get a degree in that program. But accordingly, what the lawyer pointed out, which I also agree with, is that there are limits to what a teacher can do to make the course more inclusive. If there are learning outcomes to be achieved, then all students must achieve them. So what our course is about is not how to maximize student output. There are still requirements that we should set out for students. Uh, 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 there's still requirements that we have to a demand from our students. At the same time, there are things we need to reflect on in our teaching and structures as the lawyer was careful to emphasize. Accordingly, after stating that the learning objectives must be upheld, the lawyer explained that a course in mental arithmetic is not necessarily a course that needs to be mandatory. Thus, while he believed that it could be useful for students to be able to do mental arithmetic, he questioned the logic behind making the course compulsory because it made it impossible for some to attend it. Also, he questioned whether mental arithmetic was a skill that all students had to know. Was it really a problem that they used calculators in their future professions? The problem with the course on mental arithmetic, according to the lawyer's, re lawyer's reasoning, was thus that a course on mental arithmetic was not necessarily a course that had to be included as a mandatory element of teaching, of learning. Indeed, if a widening participation and inclusion perspective had been taken when planning that course, it might have been realized that this course is good and should be included as an elective option in the curriculum, but that it wouldn't be require, a requirement in the student's future professional role and therefore should not be made mandatory. They might also have considered what to do with students who simply cannot do mental arithmetic. arithmetic. What, how do they prepare a course uh, where also they can be, uh, be part of that course? The problem could thus have been avoided if they had simply taken a widening participation and inclusion perspective from the outset. The emphasis on widening participation and inclusiveness thus makes it relevant to ask not only how to act as a teacher during lessons. One should also ask how to create widening participation and inclusion even before the course starts. They shift the focus to the structures maintained by universities and other higher in education institutions, as well as the skills and inputs of teachers. In light of this, previous structures and practices may need to be reassessed to enable more people to participate and feel included. Again, this does not mean that the course content should become easier or inferior, but it is about approaching teaching from a desire to create teaching that a from to create teaching that a diversity of people can participate in and benefit from. So, one of my goals and what I want what what I want us to work with during this course is our attitudes towards teaching and learning in higher education. I believe and hope that you have already come a long way in this journey. And, and But however, 
my personal experience is that at least I myself am constantly learning new things about the subject uh, and finding new perspectives that I want to take into account in future teaching. Therefore, I believe that we all have more to learn about teaching, uh, educating for widening participation and inclusion. And I expect that you and I will learn a lot from the experiences of the course participants from each other that takes this course on this issue. So that was all I had for you this time. Thank you for listening and I'll see you soon. Take care.